Hi, this is John McAllister, and you just heard the intro music for The Setting Trick. That is Nick Glennie Smith, who is an incredibly talented composer and has very kindly been collaborating with me on that song. The title of the song is This Is The Song About Bridge, and I wrote it uh, with Nick's help. Uh, he's making it come to life. Today we have a very special guest on the podcast, our second, a legendary bridge player who needs no introduction. All right. I've got Bob Hammond here with me. Arguably the greatest bridge player of all time. Bob? An understatement, if anything. <laughs> um, Bob, so do you remember, I was thinking about, I was thinking about what I wanted to talk to you about today. And uh, one of the first questions that I had for you is, how, what's your what's your recollection of of coming to know and meet me? Meet you? Yeah, that's a very curious deal. I mean, the first um, I'm not quite sure where it was. The first time we really ev elevated the level of consciousness is uh, dealing with the film. Right. I mean, I, I don't know if I'd met you at the club in New York or I'm sure we had stumbled into each other and had some uh, conversations of sorts at bars, et cetera. But that was the, uh, <clears throat> oh, were, were you in uh, at the brand show? Yeah, but Virginia that was after we... Yeah, that, was, that may have been... Was that first or was that... How the, early in the process was that? That was that was after... That was in... That was in 2012, I think, December of 2012. Okay. And uh, I met you... I met you in person for the first time in Philadelphia at the Summer Nationals. Yeah, 2010? 2000 Or at the Nationals. At the Nationals, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I had spoken to you on the phone beforehand uh, about the possibility of interviewing you. It was me and Jeremy Goldstein, and we were in Atlanta, Georgia at a YMCA shooting, uh, shooting for the bridge dock. Uh, one of Patty Tucker's, uh, one of the Atlanta Junior Bridge programs is taught there to a largely African-American population of... Uh, of teenage kids and Jeremy and I went out in the car and called you and I remember you telling me the story about how you started playing bridge back at UCLA and how you had been a chess player beforehand. Yeah, actually I started playing bridge before I got to UCLA, but um, it all sort of, um, ran together starting in the uh, summer of uh, 1957. I won't... Uh, so I had... <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. I, sorry for interrupting. That was my first bridge game. I think it was June 1957. I started playing duplicates. I enrolled at UCLA in the fall of 57. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> So your first bridge game, that was a duplicate or was not a duplicate? No, that was just a cut around river bridge game. In fact, I spoke to one of the guys recently who was in that game. Yeah. Of the, um, the four people in the game, there may have been a fifth. Uh, three of them are still with us. Yeah. And one of them is deceased. The haunting memory of that game that finally drove him to do himself in. <laughs> Were you playing for actual stakes? Very small. I think it was 20th of a cent a point. And how much about bridge did you know in that, in that very first time? Nothing. I'd played hearts. Okay. And 
you know, was, uh, I mean, basically, I may have dabbled a little bit with euchre. Yeah. But I have no recollection of that. It's, but hearts, I definitely had played. So you were actually about my age when you started playing bridge, oddly enough. I was, I, I mean, not, not currently, but when I learned how to play bridge, I had played hearts, and I was 18, and uh, my freshman year at the University of Virginia, and my aunt was visiting. It was my grandfather's death. She was staying with us for while we were having a funeral, and, uh, and she suggested that we play bridge. So that's how I and got started. The only problem is you had never played the game. The, yeah, I mean that was that was my that was my first time as well. I wanted to play hearts. I was I was reluctant. Now, obviously, you've gone on to a much more distinguished career so far than me. Um, but the day is young. But you've got I've got you by a couple years. So you never know. I'm gonna have to kick. Tell. I'm gonna have to kick it into into a much a much higher gear. <laughs> well, I mean, not necessarily. I mean, basically, you know, you, a real good streak for five or six years might get it done. <laughs> oh come on, Bob! You've won uh, fifteen. Yeah, but that's over a long period of time. Yeah. Huh. I mean, if you won every event for five years, it would get it done. For example. Yeah, well, Lotan Fisher and Ron Schwartz were close to doing that. Yes, they were. Well, there is, you know, <laughs> some risk attendant to most uh, processes that might get you there. <laughs> so had the other people, the other three people that you started with that time in the summer of 57, were they, were they appreciably more familiar with the game than you were? Well, they knew something about it, so I'd say they were. I mean, um, one of them uh, became a pretty good all-games player, backgammon yeah. bridge. Uh, another was a significantly capable bridge player, and a chess senior master was as high as he ever got. And the other guy was just a guy who, as far as I can tell, just went to work to work for a living, but he's the most recent one I spoke with, which huh. has been the last two weeks. So how, like, how do you start? I mean, my question is, is, I'm interested in your conversation with the, the gentleman that you spoke to two weeks ago, and, and we'll get to that. Um, but I'm curious as a, as a novice, as a novice player, as someone who teaches novice players uh, to varying degrees of success, um, how does one just sit down at a bridge table, not really even knowing the game, and all of a sudden you're you're playing well, for money? Well, you, if you're familiar with a trick-taking game, uh, that's a start. Yeah. So you have no, and I had notions for bidding uh, for hand values uh, based on playing some rummy game. Huh. What kind and, of rummy? Well, I played a five hundred. Rummy game, and uh, I also um, had played a game which is fairly uh, kindred to uh, it's a trick taking game called Rook, yeah, which Parker Brothers uh, acquired the rights to. Hmm. It had 14 cards in the suit, huh. So you had some. So you, you had a little bit of background, and uh, <clears throat> I had glanced at a rule book. So, but I was familiar with games. Right. I had played uh, checkers, chess, Chinese checkers, Camelot, which was sort of a chess checkers hybrid. Uh, and. I was a rated expert chess player at the time, so the notion of games mm, yeah. uh, if if you have never played any any strategy game, yeah 
you just have nothing to hang a hook on. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's... that certainly would make a an attempt to sit down and play day one. Yeah, I mean, there. It's certainly not a perfect fit, but uh, it's it's something mm. to. Uh, I feel like just to... I, I, uh, let me give you an example. Okay. There's no direct bearing on it. Okay. So, um, I'm compared to uh, the average business guy or lawyer or doctor or whatever. I would appear to be an absolute mathematical genius compared to math PhDs. I would look like a complete moron. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so here's a situation that, um, came up today Okay. and it may shed a little bit of light on it. And, um, the situation is that you have a radio station who has call letters, say, or call, you know, not call letters, but a frequency of 107. Okay. And you want to have U.S. currency that has the numbers 107 in it. Okay. That's the prerequisite. So how do you determine the frequency of bills that will have at least one, 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 zero, and one, seven. Well, there's a direct computation method. Uh, there's taking a li- the list of all possibilities and counting them. But here's a solution that occurred to me, which is not terribly profound which was simply assign a unique small prime number to each of the digits zero through nine. Then sorry. you with me? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. My sister called me on my cell phone. Oh, okay. so you assign a unique prime number. You have a, and then you build a table which randomly generates your, deals, but instead of using the numbers zero through nine to populate this thing, you use the eight unique prime, you use the, you use the 10 lowest prime numbers to populate it. So you multiply out the prime numbers you get, and then you divide it by the product of the three mapped prime numbers onto the numbers you get, and if it results in an integer, you've got a one, it occurred. So you construct a table in about 10 minutes to get that done without a bunch of scratching your head to do it. So having some familiarity with that particular notion made it much easier for me to do it, then go some sort of uh, either enumeration or complicated calculation. Hmm. So similarly in bridge, if you have some baseline to work off of, you're dealing with a lesser set of problems. Yeah. That doesn't mean you can't start from scratch. You certainly can. And if I was starting from scratch, the baseline I would build for myself is some kind of trick-taking game. So I'd play him. I'd have him play bridge with a designated Trump suit and just get used to the notion of taking tricks. Mm. Because the tricks that you take when you're bidding 
you're visioning, envisioning the end game, which is taking tricks. Yes. If you start out with bidding and you have no idea what the hell a trick is. Yeah. You, you, you don't even know what you're rooting for. Right. Yeah. So just some sort of anchor. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> It helps. It helps a lot. Yeah. And if you've got a few anchors, it makes the process, you know, just, it's not like, uh, I'm sure you've done Sudoku puzzles. Yeah. So if you have a board, the minimum number of clues that can give you a definitive solution is 17. Obviously, not every pattern of 17s will, enable, will produce a solvable puzzle, but that's the minimum. Hmm. Now, the the hard ones that they publish in the paper, et cetera, will typically have 27 clues. Hmm. So the analogy there is that if you have certain things you know, then solving the rest of the puzzle is greatly simplified. Right, yeah. Hmm. Does this make any sense? It makes complete sense. So consequently, uh, <clears throat> similarly in Bridge, which I harp on all the time, even when nobody wants to listen, is that uh, you only have so much bi bandwidth in your brain. Yeah. And we're not all that good at multitasking despite our exalted views of our own skills. Yes. So the fewer problems you're trying to solve concurrently, yeah. the more likely you are to be able to deal with some subset of the problems effectively. Yeah. And I always say that hand isn't going to come up again. Uh, not any time in the foreseeable future, <laughs> or it might, but that's just bad luck. Yeah. So worry about the one you're playing now. Don't fight yesterday's war. Yeah. Huh. And, um, and don't burn up a lot of energy on stuff that doesn't matter. And doesn't matter is always in the context of what you're trying to do at the time. Hmm. So if it's out of your control, the best you can do is worry about it. <laughs> and that uh, I've yet to see worrying in and of itself <laughs> result in beneficial outcomes. Mm. So what is your mindset at the table then? Pardon? What is your mindset? What is your mindset at the table? Like you're talking about what your goal is. What's your goal? My mindset is to solve the set of problems or the problem that I'm working on now mm. and to uh, look at the uh, elements that might assist me rather than uh, what am I going to have for dinner tonight? Right. Because as soon as I start considering uh, that juicy steak, I might let three no make. Mm. Yeah, I did that. And then, <laughs> then I'll be losing my appetite for the steak. <laughs> it won't even taste as good. Now, of course, if Mike Moss is buying, that changes the equation. <laughs> you anticipated one of my questions. 
<laughs> One of the questions that I came up with in the in the last week as I've been thinking about getting to speak to you is let's say you've got a a match against Lev and Mike Moss. They're your opponents. And I don't know what the stakes are, but let's just say they're let's just say you're playing for black for bragging rights. Okay, who are right. you? Who are you choosing to be your partner in this match? <laughs> well, I would choose Lev. Uh, no, 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 no. You misunderstood the question. You're playing against Lev and Mike Moss. They're, oh, I'm playing against Lev and Mike. Yeah, Moss. they're your opponents. They're your opponents. I would not have much in the way of mixed emotions <laughs> as to should I take a dive for these four guys. <laughs> <laughs> but who are you choosing? I mean, who are you choosing as your partner to make sure that you, in fact, win the match? Let's say it's a death match. Like the, the losing side. Another, another, another Bob Hammond. <laughs> but that's, that's clipped from Johnny Crawford's line. So <laughs> who, who would I pick? <laughs> Well, right now, I guess I'd pick Berkowitz because he's the only guy left who will play with me. <laughs> McAllister would be a close second. <laughs> and we we could also drag Middleman up out of the... Uh... <laughs> From the tomb? <laughs> I mean, there would be other things that you could think about. You might pick some sexy girl on the grounds that she would console me if we lost. <laughs> but I don't think that's likely, so I guess I'd have to go for the bridge outcome. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see, who would I pick as a partner in this fray? <laughs> I mean, the partner that, you know, absent Berkowitz, who were just beginning to... Uh, plow some ground with the last significant success I had uh, was playing with Martel in the old folks tournament in <laughs> Poland <laughs> so that might not be a bad choice um, I I mean see a, at least if I lost we could take it out on each other and back <laughs> I mean, I might go for Justin <laughs> because he is supreme talent <laughs> and probably a good deal more energy than any of these fossils. <laughs> uh, you know, there, you know, have, with some kind of, but assuming no preparation at all. Yeah. We couldn't discuss system. We could do nothing except sit down and play. Okay. Um, I, I would, um, pick somebody who's relentless and tough. I might go with Beckstroth. Mm. He's, he just one tough cat. Yeah. Who's properly oriented on the winning philosophy. Yeah. Uh, but you, you know, Hampson would be a good choice, uh, we could, we could branch out to Eric Greco. I've suspected Greco's been carrying Hampson for years and never getting the credit. <laughs> oh. and we could we could go with one of the young Turks. Uh, I don't know how, but how these kids play, and not knowing at least you know what you're getting if you're playing with say Maxtroff. Yeah, I mean you 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 know that there's a certain baseline that he's not going to fail you on. Yeah. And also, he's not going to drift into some esoteric th thought pattern as to how you had to have X, Y, and Z <laughs> when there are only 11 people on the planet, him being one of them who thinks that way. <laughs> Oh. So you, you you think of that type of uh, 
a player that you would uh, opt for. Yeah. Frankly, a, against that particular pair, a guy, any guy from central casting would probably be good enough <laughs> so as to not let the game get away. <laughs> I could cop the line from uh, David Carter when he would get into a discussion with somebody at the bar at a convention. Uh, Carter and uh, Nail had quite a gig, and uh, they'd go to conventions. And one week they'd be a banker, the next week they'd be an actuary, occasionally they'd be a doctor, a lawyer, or whatever. And they always found a poker game, occasionally a bridge game. Yeah. And Carter would sit in the bar and he'd be talking to some guy and uh, somehow the discussion would get around the bridge. This is no longer likely to happen in today's environment. Right. And Carter would opine that they he'd find a way to make the discussion a little heated. And uh, Carter would opine he'd take the bellboy and beat him and outside to be nail in a bellboy's uniform. <laughs> <laughs> this is the this is the the guy who's the the namesake for the nail life master affairs. <laughs> so that that's named after G. Robert Nail, <laughs> the bellman. <laughs> and they, Nail's one of the funniest guys ever. He, at one point, we're playing against Nail and Jacoby. I was playing with Kraus in the trials. And they had won the previous year, but things were going very badly for them this year, and we were leading the event. It's about round nine or ten, a pair's trials. And uh, <clears throat> we were playing in one of these, uh, a room consisting of aluminum rods and curtains hung over them. And people would come in and hand us the boards, et cetera, and we'd play. So uh, at one point after a significant disaster, Nail, who was about 5'8", no, 4'8", <laughs> he, he had stacked a bunch of chairs up, you know, the stackable chairs, with a comment of, maybe this will make it hard for the fat boy to see my hand. <laughs> So after a number of hands, maybe the fat boy wasn't having all my that much trouble seeing his hand, but because they weren't getting very good results. So Jacoby, who was a fairly sizable individual, Nail gets up off his stack of chairs and says, "James, I need to talk to you." And Jacoby, sort of like Mutt and Jeff, he follows him out, and <laughs> Nail looks up at him and says, "Are you betting on these boys?" And Jacoby now gets very defensive and says, well, Bobby, I wouldn't, you know, I may be playing badly, but there is a limit. <laughs> Nail said, relax. If there was, I just, if you were, I just wanted to have the action. <laughs> <laughs> so, now, so now the next hand, the bidding goes two hearts, I call by Nail. Yeah. And Jacoby boosts him to three and... Nail, ever the scientist, leaps to seven hearts. What? Now, I was over him with the King Jack Doubleton of hearts and the ace, ten, nine of spades, but I wasn't expecting a seven heart bid, so I just sort of passed <laughs> out of rote. And Krause's version of the facts <laughs> is I, I led the ace of spades with sweat be beating on my forehead. And a look of terror in my eyes, and dummy to my left hit with four small hearts, and Kraus said that, and so Hammond threw up on the table when Nail roughed it. Nail crossed the dummy, led a trump, and finally he was—he had it was a six-four fit. He's think, 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 and I finally took him out of his misery, and down one he went. Now, now Jacoby said, "Well." Did you have to leap to seven? Couldn't you have investigated a bit? And Nail said, well, I figured I'd have a better play for five now, for seven hearts than I would for five now, Trump. I don't... 
<laughs> what do you mean five no Trump? I don't get it. But it's still, I mean, it's a great story. I'm sorry that I'm not laughing, but <laughs> two hearts. You know, if he jumped to five no to investigate Trump runners, the implication is Jacoby would have let him play it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh. I'm embarrassed to, to ask more. You're just saying because he didn't have any Trump honors? Or just because he was that, that's how bad the... <laughs> no, he just, he didn't have to just leap to seven. He could have investigated <laughs> Trump honors okay. so in he, he was got, he, hand. He was defending his his lack of... Uh, his lack of science for saying the Jacobi. No, Nail didn't say Nail was just <laughs> getting very irritated with Jacoby and uh, <laughs> oh, was well, he really wasn't. He actually handled this stuff in pretty good <laughs> form. Um, hmm. It's never good to to have to ask about the the punchline. I never I never like being in that position when someone tells me a good joke. <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, that's the. Uh... <laughs> oh. oh my! <clears throat> so I mean, are, are we being recorded? Yeah, for sure. We, but we can okay, if you well, have some. <laughs> we'll have to continue with some stuff, maybe off the record. <laughs> um. Well, yeah, I can stop recording <laughs> if you want. Or I can record, you, you, and then you, you could. Then you could. Uh, I guess you know already whether or not it's on the. Do you want me to stop recording? Well, I don't mind, but this one particular story perhaps shouldn't be recorded. It's what I'm about to tell. Oh my God, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, because we have listeners, well, uh, and I haven't. Are stuck, they listening live? No, 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 no. They're not listening live. Um, but we actually had 514 downloads of the first episode as of yesterday. So um, who knows? What... So at any rate, there's a guy who was a famous bridge player. Okay. And uh, he's playing with a woman who was a, not only very attractive, but quite a capable player. Okay. And he gets very exasperated with her, and uh, he opines that... Uh, well, she might have certain skills. She really wasn't all that good at that either. <laughs> <laughs> oh so yeah, his, I can edit that out if you want. <laughs> his, his conduct drew a suspension. Oh. Or, or a, a bit of probation and a short suspension. Yeah. So they're playing again. And she made a very imaginative play. She had king and one over ace, queen, jack some number of times and elected to deck it when declare, appearing to have very, very few entries, uh, took the finesse. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, declare had a, one fewer entry <laughs> than she had calculated, <laughs> and this did not produce a particularly good result. <laughs> so the fellow sits there not saying a word. <laughs> Now, being a curt, certain glutton for punishment, she said, uh, I had a reason for my play. I've heard this one. <laughs> You've heard this one? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know the reason. <laughs> and this goes on, of course, the, the reason was you're a fucking idiot. <laughs> Now the now the zero tolerance police <laughs> don't have much truck with that, but uh, <laughs> at the high level competitive, I think zero tolerance is a first. There needs to be room for the thumb and the eye. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, did Gordy Howe ever talk about zero tolerance? <laughs> Or Dick Butkus. Uh, yeah, I see what you're saying. Or, or now. Roger, or, or Roger Clemens with right, the high right, inside right, fastball. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. I had a conversation the other day with uh, Jeff Bayone, who runs the Honors Bridge Club. Right. And uh, he clarified something for me that I think is an important distinction 
with regards to Bridge. And he gave Alan Graves credit for, for making this point to him. And the point is that Bridge is a mind sport. It's not just a game. It is a mind sport. And I think right. there's a difference between that and what my, one might consider a, a friendly game of cards. Yeah, it's a mind sport. you got to get in your opponent's head. Yeah. And mm -hmm. if you have to rough them up a little bit, so be it. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that I beat up on the social recreational players. I don't. Right. I mean, I, you know, I don't. I, you know, that's not what they bargained for. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> That's a good but point. if they invade if they invade my turf too deeply, then maybe the dynamic changes. Yeah. I mean, if they want to garden and knit <laughs> while they're sitting at a table, that's fine, and I can respect that. <laughs> <sighs> or do crossword puzzles. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I sent you a link this week in the email for Double Dummy, which you are a one of the stars. Maybe not stars, maybe that's a stretch, but you are one of the lead supporting actors in the film. And we open with a scene of you speaking to the U.S. under 21, or actually the, all the U.S. teams that were going to go play in Tai Song in 2012. And then we interviewed you at Sonny's, that cheesesteak's place. Yeah, I remember it. Have you have you watched the film? No. <laughs> <laughs> Send me the damn link again. Oh, my God. Bob. I can't find the goddamn thing. I mean. Oh, my God. Have you seen the trailer? <laughs> I... I will look at you've now got my interest peaked. <laughs> Incidentally, I'm having I'm having dinner with Justin and Mrs. Robinson tonight. Okay. Oh you know who Mrs. Robinson is? I had is? never heard her addressed as such. <laughs> <laughs> That's Stephanie. <laughs> I know. I know. It took me just a second, but not much more than that. <laughs> is he back living in Dallas? I have no idea. Huh. Well, please tell both of them I said hello. I will do so. Yeah. And that you uh, that you appeared on uh, episode two of uh, The Setting Trick. Well, uh, sort of like when I had the um, Ace-10-9 of Hearts six times and Ace-King Jack of spades six times, and I'm on lead against seven diamonds against the Froggies in 1980. And uh, that would have been, uh, I think, Valkenburg uh, in Holland. What was the auction? Oh, it went something like a diamond, and I cubed two diamonds, and it went two arts to my left, meaning something, and partner, a passed and jumped to four spades, and Righty bid four no Trump, and I bid five spades, and lefty bid six clubs, and righty bid six diamonds, and I bid six spades, and lefty bid seven diamonds, and I popped it rather than save, and now I am on lead. <laughs> and, uh, well, first lefty bid two hearts, that's a clue. Huh. And second, Righty blackwooded, which means he probably has a stiff spade. Okay. And partner didn't open a week two bid, though the vulnerable the suit was kind of shitty. Um, so the evidence really is probably to lay down a spade. I instead instead tried the ace of hearts, which met with an unfortunate end, and they made the grand instead of going set. Hmm. Which possibly cost us the match because yeah. it was 20-some-odd imp swing and um, 
that was approximately the margin of victory. But the deal is that these guys didn't think they could beat us. And as the match wore on, their right. opinion began to change. Yeah. And if we had uh, if we had acquired an early lead, yeah. we might have just put them out of their misery. Right. Yeah. Which happened some percentage of the time. The For teams sure. were actually pretty evenly matched, but they didn't know that. Yeah. Huh. Huh. So uh, that, uh, in fact, that was one of the first times I became well acquainted with Graves. They were staying at this place called the, we were staying at Shopkins, which was the upscale hotel. Okay. And they were staying at a place called the Appalling Apollo that had a good bar. But I would have hesitated to see the rooms. So, so much for that. <laughs> but at any rate, what I'd sought as coming out of that hand, and I was looking for something good. And when uh, mm. our friend Rodney Dangerfield uh, was in the Bud Light commercials, I remember Ben Davidson, mm -mm. who was a defensive tackle for the or the Raiders. No. So in this particular commercial Ben Davidson is standing over Rodney and uh, Rodney's bowling and he looks menacingly down at him and he says all we need is one pin and of course Rodney throws it in the gutter and my <laughs> version would be Ben Davidson standing over me saying all we need is one trick hmm. but that's not what happened so, so be it I never got the Miller Lite commercial there's still time. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that's, I mean, it's great to hear you talk a, talk a hand through like that. Because well, that, that, there's so much logic to the game, you know, there's so much. Uh, well, the game is a game of logic. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and you're not always thinking clearly. Right. I mean, there are two facets to it is not what you want things to be what do you think they are right yeah now if the answer is what you think they are is hopeless then you've got to find something that is a little less hopeless that is plausible hmm. Hmm. so you make the conditional assumption that there is a path to success hmm. and that of course that Many delusions are built on that uh, <laughs> line of thinking. Right. But that's the uh, the key. But now I'm really, you got to send me that link. Okay, I'll send it to now you when I will, done. Now I, Anna, you're going to keep me on the line for another four hours? No, it's it's uh, really up to you. Uh, as as long or as little as you as you as you're enjoying this. Well, I mean. Uh, uh, you know, if we if you've captured the essence, that's fine. If there's more nauseating remarks that you can stand, uh, we can proceed. Well, I'm enjoying every every second of your of your of your raconteuring diatribe. <laughs> um, I can tell you that Gavin and I did uh, an hour and sixteen minutes, and uh, I thought it was going to end sooner than that. And he, I was trying to give him the opportunity to get off. I, I, I didn't say it overtly, but I was uh, sort of, uh, what's the word? Uh, I was intimating that if he were, if he were ready to, to finish. But it then, was possible. How yeah. long have we been on? Uh, 43 minutes and 10 seconds. Okay. We can go a little longer, but okay. uh, effectively, the... Um, you know, I certainly uh, am very much in tune with the point of view that it is, in fact, a mind sport. Yeah, yeah. In fact, it is much more a mind sport than uh, – I would say bridge is much closer to a sport than, say, golf. Yeah, we've talked about this before. And because golf, you cannot do anything except watch helplessly – 
as your opponent plays. You can't tackle them in mid swing or right. or even yell at them. You can't you can't set traps for them. Pool is much different because you can right. put the ball in a position that makes life difficult for them. What about hitting a big drive, though? When you, I mean, you think about the tee, the 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 order of play. No, in golf. but that's a, that's a, that that's a bunch of garbage. I mean, basically, all these things are so. If you have to hit a pitcher who's throwing at you, that's much different than hitting a stationary ball. Have you ever played golf? I played one round. Oh my God, Bob! <laughs> and I, shot an 80, I shot an 84. Of no course, way. Now the truth comes out. Don't tell that me it was a nine hole holes. course. Oh. And it was an easy nine holes. Have I ever told the you the score was accurate? Have I ever told you the story about middlemen and I playing golf about no, four you years ago? Proceed. We're playing at my country club here in Charlottesville. It's called Farmington Country Club. And it's the two of us, and Middleman is horrible. He, he's, he's, he's picking up on three-quarters of the holes. And it comes to the 15th tee, and I'm one over par. So I'm okay. feeling pretty good about myself. And I say to George, actually, it was probably five years ago, 2013, I'm guessing. I say to George, so do you think I'm better at golf or bridge? <laughs> <laughs> did you check uh you know i know that you know age is against him size is against him possibly ferocity is against him but in practice uh he might have been armed <laughs> anyway he didn't have a hard time answering this question there wasn't. There weren't a lot of deliberations going on in his mind. <laughs> he quickly responded, "Golf." <laughs> the, uh, you know, of course, Boris Barron. Yeah, is definitely a classic. With regard to bridge and life. <laughs> Okay. Be, can, can you can elaborate you on that? Can you imagine this guy was a math professor by a, occupation? Really? Yeah. He played in the. I played in the imp game down in Boca, and uh, I didn't. I don't think I played with Boris as my partner, but he was there, and I played with Berkey. That's the first time I played with David. We played the first match, and then he went home because he wasn't feeling well, and his wife came and substituted for him. Which was very nice of her, because otherwise we were going to be down a player. Well, that does present some barriers. Yeah. We had one hand. I'm going to forget this. I had a... Uh, never mind. Never mind. The, 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 my, my listeners don't like it when I bring hands up and then don't remember them. So uh, that, that is, uh, I'm not going to subject them to that. We'll... we'll class this as a uh, as a minor shortcoming for purposes of this discussion. I'm thinking of another hand from uh, from that set too. Uh, shit. Mm. Yeah, I didn't Mike write Boss, it down. Mike uh, Boss at one point got into it with Jack Blair. Okay. Who was a player who had some success. I mean, pretty good player. He's even older than I am. Yeah. And at one point uh, in the elevator, Jack and Mike were going at it, and uh, Jack knocked Mike's glasses off. <laughs> so, uh, now, not really a blow, I wouldn't characterize it, but anyway, yeah. this wound up in front of a committee, and uh, Jack was placed on probation. I guess with the respect to hitting Mike for the rest of the week. <laughs> and my observation was that if it 
becomes widely known that the penalty for hitting <laughs> my boss is a week's probation for Mike won't live out the week. <laughs> Uh, uh. <laughs> Speaking of elevators, that reminds me there's a story in Sartaj Hans's book. It's called uh <clears throat> Battling the Best. Have you do you do you ever read Grits? I haven't even seen the book. Is it a good book? It's a very good book. Well, the son of a bitch should have sent me a complimentary copy. Well, hopefully he's listening and he'll do it. Sartaj. Take note. I'll send him an email that uh, that he's been mentioned and that uh, that you're you're waiting. Do you want to provide? Uh, right. When I email you that link to the film, you can send me your address so that we can get this all packaged up. Uh, I will uh, <laughs> send you an email with my. I don't know. I, you know, Bob, some of us, uh, those of us who are putting these films and these books out there, it, it's an interesting conundrum. Uh, I like to get my greedy little hands on everybody's $10, and uh, I think that's causing me a lot of, well, lot of if ambiguity you would, uh, about distributing the film. If you would be willing to occasionally, uh, John McAllister, I have you in the database. Are you sure I want to? cancel i have no idea what the hell i look up john McAllister and i catch something for alec McAllister. what database are you talking about my office database oh, okay. i'll put you in touch with sartage it's a very good book anyway the the point of the story is that sartage is talking about it's it's written from the he wrote it's about the playing the Risinger in Providence, 2014, and he goes through an expert's thinking process on who did he get to tell it to him? <laughs> <laughs> no, he's a very nice guy and a very capable player. There's no reason I have to treat him like the jerk I am. What is going on? It'll be interesting to see how he reacts to that, in ter especially in terms of sending the uh, sending the uh, book or not. <laughs> he can he can send it with an invoice attached. <laughs> Do you want to tell the story about the book that you uh, autographed for the guy and then you found it again uh, via Amazon? Oh yeah, I'm, I'm trying to remember that. <laughs> <laughs> You inscribed a book to somebody, and then you, yeah. then you like somehow came across it again, like he'd sold it back through Amazon. Somebody or... said it. No, somebody said it back. <laughs> said it to me. I'm not sure. Somebody sent me some books. They'd ordered some books on Amazon for me to autograph. Oh, right, 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 right. And these books were shipped to me. On the first one. <laughs> And the pile is what I'd autograph for somebody else. <laughs> Treat it as one of their prized possessions. <laughs> I'd forgotten about those. <laughs> oh, my. So many years ago, uh, I was, Bobby Wolf had just gotten married to Debbie Wolf. And I was playing with my then girlfriend in a tournament and uh, I picked up uh, I believe it was ace ten nine of spades ace queen jack of hearts ace king jack fifth of diamonds and a doubles and club so I bit a diamond she bit a heart and I leapt to two spades <laughs> thinking this was far too good to... and she boosted me to four okay and Wolfie unlaid, think, think, think. Well, he didn't think too long because Wolfie never does. He let a club. And dummy hits with king, queen, jack, tripleton of spades. Five hearts, king, ten, nine. Doubleton diamond, three clubs, jack. So the uh, club, club, and a club, and I roughed it. Yeah. 
Now I played the Ace Arts and the Jack Arts, and Wolfie echoed on my left, trying to confuse me, no doubt showing he had three. I put up the king and led the ten off dummy. And Debbie thought, 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 and thought, and finally discarded. I scored the queen and then cross-roughed the same 11 tricks in spades that anybody on the, the planet would take in hearts. <laughs> and my partner inquired if what should she have bid, and I said, Relax, it's only necessary to get me the ball. It doesn't matter much what the contract is. <laughs> and Debbie turns to me and said, you know, Robert, before this hand, I was one of the few people in the world who didn't e hate you, but you've blown it. <laughs> and Wolfie said, relax, dear. There are billions who've never even heard of him. <laughs> He could have said hundreds of millions. I mean, he didn't have to pile on. <laughs> Another hand with Wolfie. I probably told you this one. Yeah. So it goes a week two diamond bid pass pass, and okay. I double. Okay. I had a 19 count with three spades ace jack. And went pass, and Wolfie bid two spades, and Wrighty bid three diamonds. I doubled again, intending to show a good hand. Yeah. <laughs> and... He had a total Yarborough with four little spades and rightly or wrongly chose to defend. In this case, we didn't have enough tricks and they made three diamonds double. Yeah. So now he's all over me. He says, you know they've got a good hand when they pass two diamonds and then they bid again in this situation. And you're a complete moron. He's going on and on and on. So a few days later, I pick up four spades, queen, ten. Three hearts to the eight. Four diamonds to the queen eight. And okay. a jack and a club. This is one of the great hands of bridge. Have okay. I told you about this one? Uh-uh. Okay. So it's a famous hand from the 1988 Olympiad. Okay. <laughs> Which we ended up winning, I believe. Okay. So... The opening uh, bid is a forcing club by Wolfie. Yeah. And we're vulnerable. And my right-hand opponent jumped to three diamonds. I had queen eight fourth. And okay. went pass, pass. And Wolfie doubled. And I chose to sit for it. Okay. And when the smoke cleared, we had uh, beat it seven tricks. <laughs> oh, my God. So... And this was in the old penalty days. Yeah. So Wolfie now lays down on the table. He says, Sonny, this is what an optional double looks like. And he <laughs> laid down the ace-king of spades, the ace-king of hearts, the ace-king of diamonds, and the ace-king of clubs. What? What? <laughs> <laughs> declare, declare it six diamonds to the jack-10-9, oh. four little spades, one club uh, doubled in heart. And catching a stiff diamond and dummy, that possibly didn't play quite perfectly. <laughs> we, we gathered up the seven side tricks and then promoted the additional Trump <laughs> trick to, uh, 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 to do the hand full damage. Oh, oh my God. Oh. So, uh, this hand also involved uh, Mark Molson. It's a famous hand. Yeah. And against the Canadians at one at one table, the bidding went three diamonds, pass three hearts to this ace king, ace king, ace king hand. At the other table, it went one spade, pass three clubs to this ace king, ace king, ace king hand. So uh, both declares bid what they could make, sort of. <laughs> Against the Canadians, the person with the all the aces and kings essentially bid six no Trump. Okay. Sammy Cahill bid three no Trump. Now, of course, the Queen 10 9 fifth of clubs are parked over the Jack and one, and there's no way in hell you can make anything resembling six no Trump. Yeah. And Cahill eventually had to in place somebody to make it. <laughs> you know, set up a, it's not that tough to make. But now, 
Molson defending the hand, having it gone, I believe, three diamonds past three hearts. His partner leads a heart, and um, he has three spades to the jack, four hearts, queen, jack, ten. What's a man to do over three diamonds but bid three hearts? A stiff diamond, five clubs, queen, ten, nine. Mm. So declare with ace-king doubletons in both pointed suits, wins the heart lead, cashes both ace-kings, hope the opening leader has a stiff heart, and drives the low club to the jack, because if he's got the queen, now you have the hand made, mm. given that clubs don't go 5-1. Mm. But alas, <clears throat> the club jack fell to the queen, and now Molson, for reasons best known to himself, found a reason to return the jack of spades, hmm. which gave Declare three tricks he didn't have coming, and for dessert, squeezed him. <laughs> so six no trump was made at one table and three no trump at the other. <laughs> so now, the next year in the Vanderbilt, first time I'd really played against Mark, uh, he and Boris sit down at the table and we're shuffling the cards and everybody's, you know, pleasant enough. And I had sequestered a jack of spades in my pocket <laughs> just in case this opportunity came up. Oh, my God. And when the shuffling is done, I tossed him the card. I said, Mark, I think you might need this one sometime during the match. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, they, I, um, I never met him. I've heard I've heard nothing but good things about him, but I never. No, he was, he, gone. was a, he was a very good guy and a very entertaining guy. That guy, guy like me, who has some of the characteristics of uh, Molson, except uh, the guy who works for me isn't as nice a guy <laughs> and isn't as smart, but he has some of the characteristics. Who's that? Oh, you wouldn't know him. Full name Todd McGee. Oh, okay. But uh, there used to be, you know, some good encounters at the bridge table. Mm. Now with the zero tolerance and the shit that goes on. <laughs> Whew. Yeah, I got a zero tolerance warning in Charlottesville at a sectional last week. I weekend. got one against Hampson. Really? Yeah, I, but we won't go into the follow-on discussion. Okay. It's perhaps a little too impolite for the uh, podcast. The Maz and Paz of the world? Well, I don't know, but just Maybe. in general. They Do might you get the right idea about me, and I can't afford that. <laughs> Do you? Uh, Do you listen to podcasts? I don't believe I've ever listened to one. Oh. It's not necessarily a reflection on my hearing, but it might be. Yeah. You have a smartphone, though, don't you? Yeah, but I'm not very good at operating it, so it becomes a dumb phone in my hands. Like, what do you listen to when you drive to work? Well, <laughs> that's another subject. <laughs> <laughs> I I can barely operate the radio properly in the vehicle I have acquired recently. Uh, and the drive is so short these days that I don't actually bother to turn on the radio. Right. So the answer is nothing. Mm. Where are you and Justin and Stephanie going out to dinner tonight? We're going to the India Palace. Huh. It's a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Who chose, who chose that one? I don't know. It wasn't me. Okay. All right. Um, what kind of phone do you have? I have an Apple. Well, they have a podcast app on your phone. If you're looking at your phone. Well, I have to find it, and I found it. So the app is part of the... Uh, it's part of the operating system that comes with the phone, I believe. Does it? Is it in the general settings? No. 
It's one of the, no. it's something like music or weather or messages and it's purple and it's got like a little I, a lowercase I with two circles around the I uh, and uh, it says podcasts. The, the circles and the, and the I are in white. So if you go on there, you can search for the setting trick and you can f listen to the episode that Gavin and I recorded. And if you have Bluetooth in your car, then you can play it in your car when you're driving to the India Palace tonight. I have iTunes. I don't have a podcast app. I'll installed. take a picture of it on my phone and send it to you when I send it. Send you the uh, when the I send link. you the, the link. Yeah. Okay. I assume you're going to Philly. Oh yeah, yeah. Philly special. Well, I thought maybe you, that your senses said you'd come to your senses and decide you should give up the game, but uh, oh, that's certainly crossed that my mind. Not. <clears throat> that has certainly crossed my mind, but. I think I'm. I, I did tell you the tale about Johnny Lyon, Don Krause, and Roger Bone. I don't know. Well, Roger and Don long ago and far away finished second in the intercollegiates. Okay. And uh, they uh, decided to try their luck at the Money Bridge Club. Okay which was at the Somerton Hotel in San Francisco run by a fellow named Eric Rockney. So they had a fairly rocky afternoon, youthful college students, and uh, one of the grizzled old pros, a fellow named John Lyon, uh, offered to take them out for a drink as a bit of consolation. <laughs> and uh, as they're inhaling the first of many drinks, uh, John says to Roger, you know you're lucky. And Roger, having lost his budget for the entire year, probably. I have heard month, this one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, continue, please. <laughs> Sorry, I ruined your joke. I'm I'm crestfallen. No, that basically it'll be, it goes very, that, it'll be a very depressing dinner. It goes the the story goes that you know you're you're lucky you can get out and the other guys he's in trouble. Yeah, you play so this play you play this game so badly that you will realize and there's hope for you. <laughs> <laughs> Say it again. You play this game so badly. What? You play this game. You're lucky. You play so badly that you're going to realize it quickly and there will be time for you to amount to something. Whereas Krause, even though you're hopeless, it's going to take you longer to figure it out. And by the time you do, it will be too late. Oh, that rings true for, uh, yes. Anyway, words for an aspiring bridge player. Yeah. 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 And then there's the tale of it's the, 1964 Olympiad, and the Israeli team had read many of uh, Reese's books. And He's a great author, by they, the way. He's a great he author. He's a wonderful author, and yeah. they came up and they said, it's a pleasure to meet I guess they were playing against him. I, it may not have been the Olympiad, but okay. well, let's enough. stipulate that the tale is correct. And it's an honor to play against you, Mr. Reese, blah, 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 blah. And would you be kind enough to autograph the book? And you know what Reese said? <laughs> One spade. Pre-bidding boxes. <laughs> pre-bidding boxes <laughs> you know i had a i so i i went to a, a an all boys boarding school here in central virginia called woodbury forest and i went up there on thursday night to speak to one of the faculty members who's willing to help 
<clears throat> excuse me, willing to help me start a bridge club there. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and he's played some kitchen bridge, and we started talking about bidding boxes, and it was amazing how intimidated he seemed about the bidding boxes, which I think maybe if I had been... Maybe if it had been a year ago and I had been in the same situation, I might have dismissed his unease and said something like, oh, it's really easy. It's, it's simple, you know? And then... No, but it's, uh, it's anytime you take somebody out of their comfort zone. Right. Yeah. It, you know, it's just whatever it is, but it's very real. I know, I know, I, 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 that's, I know, and it's, it's like, it's taken me a long time to appreciate that, and I'm still, I'm still learning that, um, that lesson, you know, like, uh, with you and the podcast app on your phone, for example, I mean, you, you're a good humored guy, and you, uh, you probably may or may not even be interested in listening to podcasts, I don't know. Well, actually, I might be. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, uh, it, I mean, I've heard the words for a long time. Yeah. Well, I've been wanting to do this for for a long time. I finally got around to it. I was I was very intimidated. Well, I, I was very intimidated by the technical aspect of it, the recording and the having the right equipment. And it uh, it it took me about three weeks after I actually recorded my conversation with Gavin before I actually made it available online because I had so many hangups in terms of trying to get it up uploaded on the right website and this and that. And uh, it's been a very validating experience just being willing to push through that. Just push the buttons and let let the hand play out. That's right. That's right. Um, well, this seems like a good time. It's been a... This is a good time to call it a day, and yeah. we will chat later, sir. Yeah. I thank you. Ciao. I thank you very much for for doing this. It's, well, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be, to be your friend. Well, the feeling is mutual, my son. Ciao. Thank you. I can remember the first time I ever saw Bob in person. It happened at the NABC in Memphis. And then I got to meet him here in Philadelphia, where I am now. It's March 10th, Saturday of first Saturday of the spring 2018 NABC. This is where we filmed for Double Dummy. Bob, like I said, plays a supporting role in that film. And the introductory scene is Bob addressing all of the U.S. junior teams that were about to go play in Taisong for the 2012 14th World Youth Team Championships. Uh, so go to our website and sign up for our email list, doubledummymovie.com. We're about to start making the film available for screenings throughout the U.S., and globe and uh, it's an exciting time for me as a filmmaker to see this project being available for the bridge community so we have a screening forum there please go sign up and uh we want to hear from you thanks again for listening <laughs>